in your talk, you seemed angry about the fact that a lot of thinking power is being used for nonsense. Yeah, I think it's more a frustration than anything. Um, I wouldn't call it nonsense. I think the applications that, that we use on a daily basis, they're fun to use, they connect us like never before. Um, but many of them, if they didn't exist, it would not have any impact in anybody's life and we probably wouldn't miss the vast majority of them. And yeah, I just feel that there's this amazing intellectual capacity, this human capacity, that we need to get more of it fo focused on the big issues, the, the issues at hand, which is what I shared with you during the talk today. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you tell a bit about those? Because for people that haven't yeah. seen your talk. Yeah, so, you know, the Millennium Development Goals mm -hmm. have been an epic fail. The original plan was to eradicate poverty by 2015, and we're no closer to eradicating poverty by 2015 than we were 10 years ago when they were dreamt up by, you know, grey-minded people in windowless rooms at the UN in New York. Um, so I think we just need to have a new approach, a new approach, an approach that is more inclusive, that gives everybody a voice, that enables the crowd to mm -hmm. be active participants in architecting the world that we really want for ourselves, for but our what, children. What needs to change? I think it's a narrative. I think we need a new narrative. I think we need to um, start to use a new kind of language to articulate what it is we feel, we feel mm -hmm. is needed to improve life for people that um, are not realizing their full potential. And that is not just in the developing world. It's you know taking better care of the elderly, providing education provision that's more aligned with the needs of society in the 21st century, um, encouraging entrepreneurship, um, really getting more and more big companies engaged in the discussion, partnering with fab labs, um, it's taken, it's almost like in the days of the, you know, the days of the initial um, industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. It created some very big companies and many of those leaders of those companies, the entrepreneurs in the 18th century, were philanthropists. Yep. They enabled infrastructure to be created in Victorian times and pre-Victorian times in the UK. They built entire towns around the factory with schools and healthcare and, 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 and light railways. And I think they're the role models. The role models aren't the people that are becoming billionaires and buying 700 acres of land in Hawaii um, or making, you know, uh, um, uh, almost like a meaningless donation to an NGO because the people have got Ebola. It's, it's not real. But where does that change come from? You know, who can enable that? I think it comes from us. I think it comes from the people. Mm -hmm. I think we start to influence the kinds of um, um, the way that companies should care for us. But we're um, all using those, those, those tools that we're, we're also wasting our yeah, because, mental capacity. Because, because we're addicted to them, but we can't quite see it. Mm -hmm. So we're channeling so much energy into playing games and apps and social networking, but we can't quite see it. I mean, you see parents giving their kids iPads when they're very young, thinking it's, it's great because my young child is becoming familiar with the technology. By the time their child is 10 years old, that you won't have an iPad. It's no. just a way of keeping that child occupied while the parent gets on with their life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's distorted. You know, we need kids to be playing outside. We need kids to experience the real world, not the world through an iPad. Um, even though it's good that they've, they're comfortable with the technology, it's, I think we're just deluding ourselves. We're leading ourselves to believe that it's all about technology and the technology should be an enabler to, cre to, to architect a new kind of social fabric. The technology is only an enabler. That's all it is. You also talked about privacy and trust. Yes. That a lot of people uh, 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 give their data to companies. So how can trust be an answer on privacy issues? Well, I think the, the key issue here, and I think we see this in terms of, uh, certainly with the emerging um, um, internet of things, internet of everything, quantified self, um, sensors that are gonna you know, track our, our, our health and well-being. Mm -hmm. In order for that paradigm to really work, it's all based on data. We have to accept that 
our data needs to be used to deliver the value from the product, to tell us that you, you're too stressed out, you need to get more sleep, you haven't had a breast screening for three years. That's all quantified self is gonna revolutionize a number of industries because of data. We have to be able to trust these companies and for that data to work, it has to be part of the social graph. Mm -hmm. It has to be part of that ecosystem for the value to be created for society. But we have to be able to trust these companies. When that trust is compromised, it becomes much, much more difficult for the technology to really, really deliver the value. And, and I would argue that you know, our, we, our trust, some networks out there have compromised our trust, but we're continuing to use them. But I believe that we're entering a phase now where we're going to start to ask deeper questions about what do you do with my data? Yeah. I know I get the service for free, but what do you do with my data? So do you think there's uh, a lot of techno optimism? Yeah, I do. I, I think there's an awful lot of techno optimism and I think we're missing out some of the fundamentals of, of what I call the social fabric. But what should every individual be aware of when they use the services that we're using nowadays? I think, I think individuals need to really, I think it's almost like it's a new behavior. Mm -hmm. We've come into this world of um, free, free applications so quickly. It's almost as if it's come from nowhere. I mean, it's taken years to get here, but it's as if it's just come from nowhere. In the blink of an eye, we've got incredible devices, smartphones that have got amazing applications on them that make our lives easy. But I think the questions that we need to be asking ourselves are, who is this company? I know you need my data, but what do you do with it? Is it mm -hmm. safe? How is it stored? Um, do I trust the team at that company? Do they, do they have integrity? So it becomes more about transparency and trust because yeah. the more that we trust these companies, the more willing we're going to be to be participants in this emerging paradigm, especially of internet and things and quantified self. They're game changers. The data plays a pivotal role, but it's the trust that plays the most pivotal role, more than the privacy. Mm -hmm. You have to accept that it's going to be open and it's hooked into the social graph. And once it's hooked into the social graph, it kind of isn't private. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you believe it is, but the reality is it actually isn't private. But we have to trust the companies that are the curators of this, yeah. that they're doing it the right way. And we haven't defined what the right way is. What are the parameters? What is best practice? All of this is what we're working with and what we're trying to understand. How do we define best practice in this new paradigm? Now, um, the, the, the change that you are proposing is, is pretty fundamental and it's big. Where, where can people start? We can start with a hashtag. We can start with, with events. We can start with hackathons. We can start by collaborating with the Fab Lab movement. We can start by connecting more corporations with the Fab Lab movement and with the maker movement and with the sharing economy and bringing these worlds together. It's like the collision of two worlds, yep. but these two worlds are the reality, you know, and, and, and everybody needs to understand how we can work together and have um, um, on, a, on a common value system, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, you have to, gen I'm, I, I'm not a believer in, in this world of non-profit. I mm -hmm. think we need to wean ourselves off that non-profit mindset. It's much, much more about being able to have a sustainable business model that enables you to hire great people, to pay those great people salaries, to be able to, you know, cover the, 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 the overheads of your organization. And profit is not a dirty word. It's, it's a tool. It's what pays the overhead of your people. Mm -hmm. It's thinking about, um, yeah, I think, I think the, wor the world of nonprofits is coming from an old age. Yeah. And we need sustainable business models that enable companies, companies, for-profit businesses to have a social mission front and center in their model, in their business model. Um, it sounds like a nice recap of your, of your message. I think it is, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've worked in the corporate world. I have many, many friends. Some of the partners that we'll bring into Nordic Day will be big corporations uh, because they have the reach. What they have is the- And that's what you need? The reach to get message out, to be able to reach out to millions. Some of these companies have billions of touch points a day. Mm -hmm. 
touch points with their product, their packaging, their banking services. So it's looking at how do you leverage that reach with a new message to, to, to get that message out. We, we think it's also part of almost like a reboot of CSR. It's, yeah. it's CSR 2.0, creating shared value around something that is sustainable and business driven. That's how you level up the base of the pyramid. You don't level up the base of the pyramid by giving them um, money that's come from an NGO. You do that for people to, to survive, but to level people up to sustain and then to thrive, it's done with business. It's, it's companies like Kiva, microfinance that are part of that movement to enable people to provide for themselves and then provide for their family and then provide for their village. Yeah. And that's, okay. the few, that's what I see as being the most exciting thing about this. Cool, thank you for the interview. Thank you so much.